In preparation for the message tonight, let's turn to number 737, 737, Like a River Glorious is God's Perfect Peace, 737, and let's stand to sing. that I did this morning in the bulletins, which I hope you have picked up a copy today. Uh, you'll find a full-color insert for our creation conference on Sunday, November 13th. This is a little miniature poster. This is not just to be put in the drawer at home so that you'll be reminded of it because your bulletin also has that same announcement in it. This is so that you can do a little bit of the very timidest kind of evangelism. Uh, if you don't mind, please take these little posters and post them someplace where you go. Someplace where other people will see it. Someplace where someone might actually come to the conference and as a result of your effort of putting that up there, hear the gospel of Christ and be saved. Or have their mind changed where they have before doubted the Bible concerning the six days of creation, which were six literal 24-hour days, and they've been confused because of evolution and because of what they've been taught in the schools. And they might hear something that transforms them not only to where they believe in real creationism, but where they may become a bold witness for it. Young people, college-age students, those all the way from elementary school all the way up through college and graduate school are hearing the devil's lie of evolution. And you might be the one doing a work of ministry by putting this up someplace a grocery store perhaps, another store where you know the proprietor, a place where there is a public bulletin board somewhere, and someone directed by the hand of God might see it and come. Not just because we want more people here in the building, although that's always nice, 
but so that they will hear the truth. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, we're going to have with us Derek Isaacs, speaker from Creation Ministries International, tying the Word of God together with the real-life world in which most people around us are living so that they can see the Bible really has answers to their questions. A lot of those questions are written in the little question mark that is up here at the top of the page. You can read through those, not during the sermon, but you can read through those questions that people are asking today, and there are answers in the Word of God, and science supports the Word of God. So please, take those and post them somewhere where they will be of benefit to someone else, not merely the dark inside of your cabinet drawer. Now let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts. We are looking, excuse me, Acts is where we have started our study in elders and deacons, uh, but we're continuing our study in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Now you recall that last time together we began our study of what elders are in the New Testament. We're talking about people who have a position of spiritual leadership in the church. We've already spent five weeks discussing deacons and the responsibilities that deacons have, and we've seen that it is from the pool of deacons that God draws out those who will be elders and leaders in the church on the very important spiritual matters. In the spiritual warfare, they are the ones who are supposed to be leading the attack. They are the ones who are supposed to be caring for the sheep as a shepherd cares for his sheep. They are the ones who are supposed to be defending against false doctrine, which so insidiously creeps into the church, such as things like evolution, which has crept into many churches, destroyed many churches, and caused many young people to defect from the church in our generation. The various studies that have been done have indicated that this is one of the primary reasons that young people defect from the church in the 20th century. And so this is a very important issue to be discussing as we look at the responsibilities of the elders. Beginning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. That goes back to that qualification, the husband of one wife, and that's the one Paul pulls out to go over and to enlarge on. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Two different things that relate to the devil and elders can fall into both of those. And then Titus, chapter 1, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for bishop, and you see he spoke of elders in verse 1, uh, verse 5, and now he uses the term bishop in verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. 
Now very briefly, last week we began our overview study. We'll be doing a great deal more study on this as we get further into the book of Acts because the elders are spoken there more specifically and we see ways in which they function and also the way that they are placed into office as we move through the book of Acts. So our studies in elder bishop at this point are only overview kind of studies but we hope that we can hit the main points. You notice the first thing we saw last week was that elders and bishops are equated in Titus chapter 1 verses 5 and verse 7. We saw that the terms were used to designate two different aspects of the position in the church. The term elder designates spiritually mature men with the gift of pastor teacher appointed by the evangelists or the apostles, what we would call church planting missionaries today, to oversee the local congregations. The term bishop, on the other hand, was the idea that emphasizes the function and responsibility and authority of the elders in doing the actual oversight of the congregation. Whenever we look in the New Testament, we find that elders are always in the plural, in contrast to some modern churches which claim that the term only refers to the one single senior pastor of the church that has multiple deacons. But in the New Testament, we see multiple elders in each of the churches. We saw that in the New Testament, apart from elders in the church, the term is used of, of age, it's used of ancestors, it's used of rank or position of responsibility among Gentiles, it's used of rank or position of responsibility among the Jews, including their heads of families, the members of the Sanhedrin, those who manage public affairs in various cities. And then we saw, of course, it is also used of the 24 elders in heaven surrounding the throne in the book of Revelation. Of course, our focus tonight and through this study is the way in which it is used of qualified, and I'm speaking of qualified leaders appointed over every congregation in the New Testament, those who have been gifted by the Holy Spirit with the appropriate spiritual gifts, and those who have been raised up and qualified by the Spirit for the work of the spiritual care and oversight of the churches. We saw that missionaries who had established churches appointed elders in those churches. And we find that the Apostle Paul, writing to Titus, also speaks to him of his responsibility, having founded some churches in Cyprus and in Crete, to appoint elders in those churches. He gives that responsibility to Titus. We find on Paul's missionary journeys that he is the one who ordained and appointed with either Silas or Barnabas, who traveled with him on various journeys, elders in the church. When they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. A very important and very serious warning that is given to us in the New Testament is that men who were once qualified can disqualify themselves. You recall the passage we read last week uh, in the book of Acts chapter 20 where Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders. And he warns them about some men who are going to do some evil things in the church at Ephesus. I'll read just a few of those verses to remind you. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came unto you in Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. And then skipping down to verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, that is the church, God looks at the church as his sheep, they belong to him, Christ is the chief shepherd, pastors are but under shepherds, elders are but under shepherds, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, and we'll see in a few minutes that word overseers is the word bishops. He's speaking to the elders at Ephesus, and yet this is episcope, the word overseers, there in the plural, it's the word that is used and translated bishops in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. So God, the Holy Spirit, has made the elders as overseers, as bishops of the flock to feed the church of God. Very interesting word. We'll see that in a few moments too. It's uh, poimino, the word used to shepherd. It's what a pastor does. It's the word in its noun form that is used for one who is a pastor or a pastor teacher. 
which he hath purchased with his own blood. God has purchased the church with his own blood. That is an emphasis on the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fascinating little message that Paul gives here where he ties all of this together. It's his last exhortation to those whom he has ordained as leaders at the church at Ephesus as to the things that are coming and how serious their responsibility is. Too many men who are placed as elders in congregations all over the world not only do not meet the qualifications that God has set forth in his word, but in fact they do not take it seriously. They always have other things more important to do. If, if two things come up at the same time, it's far more important for them to do the other thing than it is to fulfill their responsibility to the church. The Holy Ghost has made them overseers. It is the flock of God. It is the flock that Jesus purchased with his own blood. That, friends, is a serious responsibility. That's why we need to pray for deacons, first of all, that God will raise up men who to fill that office of deacon so that they might manifest their fulfillment of the 17 qualifications that are given for deacons and then from that group appoint elders who seriously consider their responsibility before God for his flock purchased with the blood of Christ. This is no lackadaisical manner. Nothing that is insignificant in the sight of God. Paul goes on, For I know this, that after my departing, last time he's going to see them. You know, there's always wolves waiting in the wings for the skilled shepherd to depart so that they can come in and attack the flock. Always looking for the absence of a shepherd. Friends, they're out there. You know that some of them have picked off parts of this flock here. They look for the stragglers, they look for the young ones, they look for the weak ones. They look for those who have fallen behind and then they go in with their insidious doctrines. They go in with their wicked slander. They go in and seek to pull people out after themselves. And that is precisely what the Apostle Paul warns of in the next phrase. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Friends, human shepherds die. Human shepherds are sometimes taken out of the way by illness. Human shepherds are sometimes called to serve in a dif different portion of God's flock. Human shepherds, because of their faithfulness, are sometimes, like the Apostle Paul, arrested and put in prison so that they can't shepherd the flock. And when that happens, there are wolves in the wings and there are quislings on the inside. These elders at Ephesus were men that Paul had ordained to that spiritual office and ministry. They were men who had demonstrated themselves at one point to be qualified men. But they became disqualified through sin. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Then Paul writes 
in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, explains that when men disqualify themselves by sin, they must come under church discipline. Speaking about the elders, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, some folks don't recognize this, but what Paul says there, he uses a very special word. He says they should get double pay. That word double honor there is a double re remuneration. Those who are laboring, malista is the word. By that I mean to say, it's especially this, they who labor in the word and doctrine. We'll talk about that more when we get into our detailed study of elders, but I point it out to you now. 1 Timothy 5.18, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. The Apostle Paul is here pointing out the responsibility not only of the church to him as an apostle, and he speaks of times over in First and Second Corinthians where he chose to forego a salary for the sake of the weakness of the church, both its spiritual weakness and also its weakness in things temporal. But here he reminds them that those who are in the position of elder, laboring in the word and doctrine, are not to be muzzled so that they cannot be partaker of the fruit or the field over which they are laboring. And then in verses 19 and following, he says, Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. The Old Testament law of the two or three witnesses is brought over into the New Testament on very many occasions. And the Apostle Paul is here quoting it in relation to those who would accuse an elder of sin. We'll talk more about the type of accusation when we do a detailed study, but he says there have to be at least two or three witnesses. You can't take it on the basis of one witness. Verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. There is to be public discipline of elders who sin. Not a pleasant thought. And Paul knows it's not going to be a pleasant thought, and that's why he says in verse 21, he gives them a charge with his witnesses being God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things, that is, don't receive an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, and don't forego the discipline that has to take place for an elder. That you observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. You say, well, it would be okay to discipline so-and-so because, after all, he's not that important. He doesn't swing that much weight. But, boy, we've got to be very careful about disciplining this guy because this particular man, you know, he really has a lot of clout and he's got a lot of money. We'd better watch out to make sure that we don't offend him because, after all, it might just dry up the giving in the church. That business of partiality, James speaks of it also. What a dangerous sin it is, preferring one before another. And then he speaks of ordination in 1 Timothy 5.22. The place you solve this problem is making sure that you don't ordain somebody who is not qualified in the first place. Lay hands suddenly on no man. That's ordaining the elders in the context here. Neither be partaker, and that's a fascinating use of the word. That's quite an echo. That's the word for having fellowship with. Neither be partaker, koinoneo, of other men's sins. And what is its context? The context is fellowshipping with them in sin by refusing to exercise discipline. Keep thyself pure. You know, there's so much said about elders in the New Testament. We're, we're covering some stuff tonight that is heavy. But this is just scratching the surface. 
When you begin to track through the passages in the New Testament, because the Apostle Paul, that is the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, and through the Apostle Peter, and through James, and for other writers of the New Testament, saw this as a critical issue for the church. That's why we spent so much time on deacons, because from that pool is the pool that you draw to have men who are qualified to be elders. And so now as we move to the second part tonight, there are 17 qualifications for a man to be appointed a deacon. There are 21 qualifications required for a man to be appointed an elder. We had an overview of the office last week. This week we want to begin an overview of the various qualifications that are given to us in these two passages. And of course we'll spend more time on this later on. The first thing I think that we notice here in verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, there's a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop. It is proper and appropriate to aspire to the office of a bishop or elder. And as we've said before, the various qualifications that are given both for deacons and for elders are things that are part of the normal Christian life. These things that are listed for us are not superhuman type of things that, you know, oh, only a few people can reach that. Each of these qualifications are things that should be a part of the normal Christian life. Someone who is controlled by the Spirit of God, someone who is walking in fellowship with the Lord, someone who is growing in his faith, someone who having grown in his faith has reached a point of spiritual maturity whereby he can lead others also in the things of Christ. It is appropriate and proper to aspire to the office of bishop or elder for that is an aspiration to spiritual maturity and exercise of gifts that God has given. It obviously, I think, assumes the proper motive as explained in the following verses there in that passage that we just read. There are men who aspire to the office of a bishop or elder for the wrong motives. But you see, as you look at the qualifications, for example, some, some aspire to it because they think they're going to make money off this. You see this greatly enhanced over the centuries by the Roman Catholic organization whereby boys become men and they say, I think I would like to have a job where I can get a lot of money out of it. So I'm going to aspire to be a bishop because I get to wear these fancy robes and I you know, get to live in this palatial mansion and I get all kinds of money from this. And you look at the history of Rome and you see the, the massive amounts of gold that have poured into the coffers of Rome. There are false motives. But you see, if qualified men were placed in office, the husband of one wife, for example, how many priests or bishops or archbishops or popes do you know? who are the husband of one wife. If the qualification, a man who's not covetous, how many of them would that disqualify as they go for the gold? But friends, it happens in Protestant churches too. You see, you can't leave out any particular qualification that's listed by Paul in Timothy or Titus. And there are a few scattered others here and there, but those are your primary passages. You can't leave them out because when you leave out one of them and say, well, that one's not important, that is the place where you're going to have the problems. But you can aspire to those things because those are qualifications that are not impossible. They are part of the normal Christian life. Rather interesting, the second observation here is the office of elder is a lot of work. If you want to skip out on the work and have other people do it, don't take the office. There are elders probably in almost every church that has ever existed that want other people to do the work. They would rather sit aside and just sort of be the boss. And we'll talk about that later on, not at this point, but I, I want to let you know that there are churches that look Differently, they have what they call ruling elders and teaching elders. Friends, the Word of God doesn't make a distinction. The ruling elders are the teaching elders. And we'll deal with that more in detail when we get down to our 
extensive study at a later date. But it is a matter of work. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And the word that's translated work in that phrase is the common word ergon. It's the word that is used for labor. It's the word that is used for toil. It is the word that is used of people's occupations. It's not just like, oh, I'm going to do a good work that will gain me access to heaven kind of thing, like helping a little old lady across the street or dropping some money in the plate. This is the word for work. If he desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. This is not a job for lazy men. This is not a job for men who pass the buck. This is not a job for men who want somebody else to do it while they sit home watching television. He desires a good work. Rather interesting, the elders are not the ones, though, who are supposed to do all the work. This very same word is used in Ephesians chapter 4, where it applies to all believers who have been taught by the leaders in the church so that the believers, the congregation, can minister to others by exercising their spiritual gifts. Listen to what Paul says. He speaks of the leadership gifts, what they do, and then he tells what should happen with those who have been taught. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles, there's a leadership gift, and some prophets, there's a leadership gift. And some evangelists, there's a leadership gift. And that's what we would call today church planning missionaries. And some pastors and teachers, that's the gift of pastor, teacher, leadership gift. It's got what's called a copulative chi, the word and, which joins pastors and teachers, indicating that we're talking about a a specific individual, one person, with the gift of pastor-teacher. They're also the gift of teacher, but here the four leadership gifts that are mentioned are apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor-teacher. What is their job? It says, God gave those for the perfecting of the saints. Now, that word there is not the word for making mature, teleos. That word perfect or perfecting is found in other portions of the scripture which deals with bringing to maturity. They do have that responsibility, but that's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is katartizo, has nothing to do with teleos. It's the word that you use for repairing something that's broken. It's the word that is used, for example, of mending nets in the gospels, broken nets that need to be fixed. It's a word that deals with, like, if you had a lawnmower, as I had the other day, that wasn't working, I had a man come over and help me and show me how to make it work. And so, once I was able to do that, I was able to cut the grass. He didn't cut the grass for me. He showed me how to fix the lawnmower. He took some parts off, showed me I had to replace the filter in it, showed me how to use this stuff called Quick Start to spray it into the engine, right in the carburetor area, and bingo! <laughs> That's only for Catholic churches, right? Bingo. Uh, he, he showed me suddenly <laughs> how I could pull it and start it instantly. But he didn't cut my grass. I cut my grass. The job of leadership is to repair the saints and show them how they can do the work of the ministry. That's what we find in the next few phrases. The word for, where it says for the perfecting of the saints, is pros. That ties it back to the four leadership gifts in verse 11. Their job is to repair, if you will, the saints. No, not those guys who stand around in stone statues in front of Catholic churches and Episcopal churches. Those guys are not the saints, or the ones who have been canonized, or beatified, or whatever. The saints are all believers. We find that very clearly stated for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where the first nine verses of that epistle, Paul commends the believers at Corinth, and he speaks of them as saints. And then beginning in verse 10 of chapter 1, he begins to excoriate them, that is, he begins to bawl them out for all their wickedness. 
He calls them saints not because they are sinlessly perfect. He calls them saints not because they have been canonized by a pope. He calls them saints because that is their position in Christ. They are set apart ones in Him. Everyone who has placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ is, in the eyes of God, a saint, a set apart one. And so Paul writes here that they have been perfecting the saints, but the next word for is a different Greek word. It's the word ace. The word that means unto. Perfecting the saints unto the work of the ministry. Then you have another ace translated for, excellent translation, but sometimes we miss it, unto the edifying, which means to build up, like our word edifice, it's a building, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You see, all the work is not to be done by the pastor or the elders. Their job is for repairing the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry, so that the saints can build up or edify the body of Christ. Two things that we learn right out of that very first phrase here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 3 and verse 1. Now last week we looked at the term elder and the way a man in the office is to function with spiritual maturity gained from years in the faith. That was the Greek word presbyteros, and that's the word we get our English word Presbyterian from, a congregation subject to elder rule. But the corresponding term that we're looking at more in detail tonight is the term bishop. It comes from the Greek word episkopos, which is a compound Greek word, epi, which means over or upon, and skopeo, which means to look or to watch. And that's the word we get our English word episcopal from, comes from episkopos. And there's an episcopal organization right down the street from us here. That word episkopos, as I mentioned just in passing a few moments ago in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, is the word that is used of the elders in Paul's farewell address to them. But in that verse it is translated as overseers. He's called for the elders of the church. He's speaking to the elders of the church. And then he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That is, the Holy Ghost hath made you bishops. Those who oversee the spiritual care of God's flock. And it says, To feed, the verbal form of to shepherd, to be shepherds over the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. You see, these things are tied together. Those who are elders are also bishops. Those who are elder bishops also must have the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher, for they are to shepherd, they are to pastor the flock as under-shepherds, under the one who is the great shepherd and bishop of our souls, as Peter calls him, our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as we saw that the apostolic church envisioned multiple deacons, the New Testament also presents a plurality of elders or bishops in a local congregation that are distinct from the deacons. Philippians 1.1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops, plural, and deacons, plural. The term bishop also has as its chief example the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the term deacon had as its chief example Christ, and we looked at a number of verses where we saw it was the word translated minister or serve, used of Christ, and the term pastor, which means shepherd, and has as its chief example Christ as well. You see, church leaders must follow Christ in the way they deal with his flock. 1 Peter 2.25 tells us, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And in that context, he is speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Whereas the term elder dealt with a man who has extensive spiritual experience, understanding, and maturity, the term bishop is used of the same man to indicate the nature of the work which he has undertaken. That is to say, to watch over the flock, exercising his gift of pastor-teacher. That's what we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-4, through 4, where the elders are exhorted to do the work of bishops, to oversee and to pastor, that is to feed the flock of God. Beginning in verse 1, Peter writes, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. Now Peter was an apostle. But Peter viewed his work in light of his responsibility to the body of Christ. He didn't lord it over them and say, I'm an apostle, and there are very few of us who have that particular gift, so the rest of you guys better listen to me. He's writing to the elders as an elder. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And then what does he tell them to do? He tells them to do the work of a pastor. He says, feed the flock of God, which is among you. Poimino. Feed them. There's so few churches where the elders do that. Taking the oversight, there we have our word for bishop. Not by constraint. You don't have to be forced to do it. Somebody browbeat you into it and finally say, okay, okay, I know it's my job, I guess I'll do it. Not by constraint, but willingly. And you've got to have the right motives too, he says. Not for filthy lucre, because you're going to make money at it. But of a ready mind. The motivation starts inside. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. You might say, well, there's not much money in it, but boy, I sure feel good being in charge of all those people. they got to do what I say. No, it's God's heritage. You are not a lord as an elder or a bishop or a pastor, as we call. Neither as lords over God's heritage, but here's your responsibility, but being examples to the flock. You set the tenor for how the church is to be in its spiritual life. But there is a payoff someday. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd, that is Jesus, shall appear, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. <laughs> Greedy of filthy lucre lasts such a short time. Crown of glory that fades not away. How few men there are that are willing to wait for the crown of glory that fades not away. As we noted a few moments ago, the term for bishop or overseer is episkopos. The term episcope is the word translated the office of a bishop in 1 Timothy 3.1. This is a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop. An episcopos is a bishop, an episcope is the office of the bishop. He desireth a good work. A, good work. a bishopric or the office of a bishop can be lost through sin. That's the term, bishopric, that is used of what happened to Judas. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, and we've seen this in detail, so I'll merely read it through and point it out. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas. And we noted at that time that the quote that Peter makes, you and I probably would never have put together with Judas, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter speaks these words that this passage out of the Psalms applies to Judas. For he was numbered with us and obtained part in this ministry. That is, he was one of the apostles there. 
Now this man purchased a field with a reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. And then here's the quotation. Notice the word that Peter uses as he quotes it, not in Hebrew, but in Greek. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric. That's episcopate. That's the same word Paul uses in 1 Timothy 3.1 for the office of a bishop. Let his bishopric, let another take. I think we need to make something very clear here at this point. A spiritual office can be lost, but the spiritual gifts can never be lost. A man who has the gift of pastor teacher may lose the office of a bishop. He may disqualify himself as an elder or be disqualified. He does not lose the spiritual gift of pastor teacher but it is suddenly truncated, it is suddenly curtailed in its usage because he has disqualified himself from what we call pastoral ministry. There are many men who have done that, many men who have had to step down out of the pulpit in shame because of immorality or because of the way in which they've embezzled money from a church. They don't lose their gifts, some of them become quite frustrated. Some of them insist on going back into ministry. And you see the same thing happening over and over again. I know of one man who's been in three different churches, committed immorality in all the churches, because some people followed him to his new church from the former church. He pulled away people after himself. And then, in one case, the man who is most loyal supporter, he committed adultery with that man's wife. People... God means it when he speaks and tells us who is qualified and who is not. But you cannot lose the spiritual gifts. Paul makes that clear in Romans 11:29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The term gifts that is used here in that verse is the Greek word charisma, from which we get our word charismatic. People who emphasize the seven now canceled temporary spiritual gifts that were given during the apostolic period, that is the gift of tongues, gift of interpretation of tongues, gift of healings, gift of miracles, gift of apostle, gift of prophet, and the gift of knowledge, which was the reception of new special revelation. Paul uses that very same word in the very next chapter, in fact just a few verses later, in Romans chapter 12 verse 6, to speak of the spiritual gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And he goes on and he discusses the spiritual gifts and how it is the Holy Spirit who divides to every man severally as he will and how the gifts are designed to minister to and to build up the body of Christ. Leadership gifts repair so that we can do the work of the ministry, the rest within the congregation. Oh, how, how far we have fallen from that, expecting spiritual leadership to do all the work. Never realizing that our job is to teach, to instruct, to repair. So that every believer might use his or her gift to build up the body of Christ. There in Romans chapter 11 where Paul says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, he's tying together a former section dealing with national Israel with the next section which deals with spiritual gifts. He's dealing with the issue of election. He's dealing with the way in which God sovereignly chose and then how God gifts. And in that context, he's dealing with the choice that God made of national Israel. The unconditional covenant that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes. Beginning in verse 25 of chapter 11, which immediately precedes that verse that we just read. 
Paul writes and he says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. He's talking about real Jews. He's not allegorizing it as do the amillennialists who try to say Israel is the church and the church is Israel. He's talking about, obviously, national Israel here. Because he contrasts it with the times of the Gentiles have come in because blindness in part has happened to Israel. It's not blindness in part has happened to the church. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so shall all Israel be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion. Zion is not the church. Zion is Jerusalem. The deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob is not the church. For this is my covenant unto them. Not my covenant unto you there at Rome. Those of you who are Christians at Rome, that's to whom this epistle was written. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. If you've ever lived in Israel for a while, you recognize that there is very strong opposition among unbelieving Jews who are still blind in the reading of the law, and they will be so, as Paul explains also in Romans, until that veil of blindness is taken away. But right now they are enemies for your sakes as touching the election. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Who are the fathers? He's just told you. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's the next verse for the gifts and calling of God or without repentance. God called them. God chose them. God gave them some covenant promises that will never be broken. But he says the gifts are also without repentance. Just like God will never turn his back on Israel, God will not take away the spiritual gifts that he gives which are designed by him to be used by you in the context of the church so that you might edify and build up the body of Christ. Now don't say, well, do I have the gift of tongues? No, you don't. I can tell you that right now, because that has been canceled. Romans chapter 13, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, excuse me, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that the time when the gift of tongues would be nullified, as well as the gift of prophecy, as well as the gift of knowledge, those three gifts would be nullified with the completion of the New Testament canon. Don't think you've got that gift. Think about the other gifts that God gives. Wish all of you could have been in prayer meeting four years ago when we covered that. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Paul's usage is in the context of election. Just like he doesn't make you non-elect after he has elected you, he does not take away the gifts that he has given to you. But, in very short summary, the offices can be lost, whereas the gifts can never be lost. Spiritual leadership can be curtailed or truncated by sin. So a man is disqualified, he no longer has the, the sphere of influence in which to use his gift. Though he may still seek to lead others to Christ and help them grow in their faith. The word episcopate is also used in some very interesting ways. It's translated visitation in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, where it's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd and bishop, who will shepherd with a rod of iron someday. You know, as you look at Psalm 2, and you look at Psalm 110, you find some very interesting prophecies. And I've, I've preached on those psalms before, so we won't cover it in detail here. But it says, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Speaking of the Gentile nations whom he will crush, who have stood against and persecuted the people of Israel. He says he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. He's going to shepherd them, not with a, a staff whereby he taps somebody, but he will rule them with a rod of iron, which breaks people until they are forced to bend the knee. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, even those who hate him. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen to Peter's words in 1 Peter 2.12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day 
of visitation. The word visitation there is in the day of bishopric. When the chief shepherd, the overseer, comes, these people will be forced to glorify God. Coming back to check up on the world, if you will, and make sure that things are in order in his house. The verb episcopeo is also used of doing the work of a bishop. 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. That's episcopeo. Taking the oversight. You elders, make sure that you are doing what God called you to do. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. I had hoped we might get a little farther than that, I think, before we begin to look at each of these qualifications. And we've only just scratched the surface on these passages, but I want you to be aware that they're there. The passages dealing with elders are not merely the passage in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. You have multiple passages in the New Testament that tell us a lot about elders and how elders are to function and what has to be done for elders who sin. What has to be done publicly for elders who sin. I think we'll stop there. We'll look at blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, things like that. I think we'll save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word. It is a serious word. But Father, because we take your word for granted, oh, we claim with our mouth that we believe it, but we put the lie to our lips by the way in which we treat it, by the lackadaisical way in which we obey it, by the foolishness that we substitute for it, coming up with our own ideas of what's important and what's not important. Father, I pray that you will take your word and convict our hearts, that your word will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Father, cause us to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And Father, once again we pray that you will raise up men here who are qualified to be deacons, men who show forth all those qualities that your word requires, who are living the normal Christian life, who are growing in their faith, who are eager in their study of the word, who are humble in their faithful service to the body of Christ. And from those men, Father, we pray that you will raise up in the years that lie ahead if our Lord should tarry, men likewise qualified to carry on the ministry of this church as elders. Father, elders die. Deacons die too. Pastors die. And it seems that each time the wolves come in and pick off a few more. Each time there are those who want to pull a following after themselves. And so the church is shrunk again. Father, only you can cause that hemorrhaging you can stop it. You can cause it to be immediately brought to a halt. You can bring in those whom you would have to be in this congregation so that it might be strong and healthy and well. A testimony to this unbelieving world around us and a haven of refuge for those sheep which are weak and wounded and who desperately need repair so that they might do the work of the ministry so that they might edify the body of Christ 
Father, we thank you again for your word and pray for your blessings upon it as it has gone forth. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.